Okay, brilliant. So, I just want to know, so I get a little indication, um, whether I'm preaching to the converted or how many I'm converted. How many here actually hold any type of blockchain-based wallet? Whether it's crypto, Ethereum, okay, all right. Um, how many here have a Samsung phone? Okay, all right. So, I just sort of want to predate, sort of start the speech with addressing that there's a, often a misconception that why are we going to, who's going to go out and get these wallets? Why are there going to be millions of people coming in droves that are going to suddenly accept it? But, um, as you're probably aware, but you know, every new Samsung phone that's going to come out now is going to have a crypto wallet embedded in it. So just bear in mind that what, what I'm going to speak about, the smart contracts and some of these you know, complicated instruments that may look complex at first, you're going to be able to execute across the world on whoever has a new smartphone contract. And we all know the smartphone cycles. They're pretty quick, so we, we sort of went from 12 months to 18 months, it's an upgrade cycle, so you can start to see 12 to 18 months, you've probably got around a billion users having a blockchain enabled wallet. It, th so the game changer is not going to come from some killer app, some random app, and then everybody runs to it and it's like, oh wow, you know, now we're all on the blockchain. No. You're going to have it embedded in devices and, and it's just going to become seamless and friction, right? Okay, um, so let me start just why, what made me come to the journey, what made me realize that the banking of tomorrow is not going to be done by our legacy banks. It's not going to be managed currently on how it's been managed, right? So, um, sort of about five, six years ago, we set out, um, you know, Bitcoin had sort of matured enough to have some liquidity, started to see an, an early adopter phase, and very excitingly, you know, London has set up the first FinTech Accelerator, we got accepted on there, I put, I put a condition that they would have to accept Bitcoin to accept me onto the Accelerator, and they would have to put that on the balance sheet of the Canary Wharf Group, which, if you don't know, is the is the sort of mothership of investment banking, it's the one that created the one of the largest investment banking campuses in the world. And then, we, the, the initial startup that I formed was using something called unspent transaction outputs, UTXO as they call them on Bitcoin. And we were using this as a small bit of data that you could put on each transaction on Bitcoin. And we were using these UTXOs to top up mobile phones. So we've created a bridge to be able to top up your mobile phone with, with a unspent transaction output. And all swimmingly well, we're getting early adopters, you know, we were starting to see traction in Asia, Africa, across. And that was on a sort of beta phase. We then got a, I got a call and it said, um, we like to, the mobile provider, the aggregator, um, is, I won't mention it, it's a very large American corporation. It said, we'd like you to send these payments through a bank account because our compliance department doesn't see this fit. Um, and it, it can't understand these tokens, so can you send it through a bank? I said, fantastic, no problem. If you've been to Canary Wharf, you know, the, our offices sort of, um, that we've been incubated in, flashy, overlooking um, head office of Barclays. So I popped across the, um, went downstairs, set an appointment, um, applied online for a bank account at Barclays, um, and um, I got a I got a message and I got um, saying, unfortunately, you've been refused a bank account. So I was like, okay, they're across there. Let me set an appointment with a manager there. You know, it's the head office. Obviously, they're going to have a sort of forward-looking. Went across, um, and I said, so. Okay, sat down um, with the manager and I said, look, if you just explain to me in honest words, why are you not letting us have a bank account or a blockchain technology provider, we're providing for the country. 
And he said, look, I'm going to be candidly frank with you. What is the reason? And um, this is when it blew my mind that, okay, we really are dealing with sort of legacy dinosaurs here, right? Um, so he said, look, you don't fit our risk matrix, right? So your risk profile doesn't fit what we need to do here. And that, I said, okay, explain to me which part of what we're doing as a blockchain technology provider doesn't fit your risk profile. And he said, look, um, so our company's called Blockchain. Um, this is before blockchain was trending. And he said, look, the, we, we can't put someone on our books who deals with blocks and chains because they could hit someone or drop on someone, right? And that's not the type of activity we bank, right? Because on the, on, on the general form in the UK, you sort of say any other business and you sort of explain what it is and there was no profile for it, it was blockchain, right? So really what you have is these banks that are too wide, too big, too wieldy, and innovation doesn't talk to onboarding, um, you know, customer services. It's, it's, one giant organism that is kind of out, out of sync with itself, right? Um, you know, initially it's a little bit daunted. It was like, okay, we're getting a lot of pressure from the US to have a bank account for one. But I thought, okay, actually the opportunity here is much bigger. It's not us setting up this new telco network and some of these other disintermediations we're doing, however great they are. We can actually look to recreate the entire banking architecture as it sits today. A, there's too much legacy in the existing system, they have to onboard the way they structure themselves, and B, they don't have a concept of agility to onboard, iterate fast, fail fast, and move that you definitely need to have as a prerequisite to launching a blockchain project. So banks will implement a successful examples, but they're not going to be the novel innovators in this space. So it really gives an opportunity for the first time in, you know, potentially 100, 200 years, where you can sit with a small team, be agile enough, take some of these smart contracts, take some of these stacks that are readily available and offer something that gives you 18 months ahead of the bank, build up your traction. But, um, so it's a prelude that it's not always obvious on how you're looking. A, adoption is going to come from embedded wallets in stacks, and B, why you refuse the, the hurdles you see and what the adoption problem with blockchain is not as it seems, right? There's a, there's a kind of disconnect in, in how people are perceiving when this is going to happen. This is already happening and it's already happening at scale. Okay, um, so I'm going to speak about smart contracts for banking. So bear in mind, we're trying to design out legacy banks. We're not, we're not trying to put a wrapper around. We're not trying to sort of molly cuddle a, a current bank apparatus and say, okay, we'll make it a tiny bit more efficient or different. We're saying, okay, let's rethink the entire banking stack, right? Um, a, a lot of it is tech, I've tried to strip out the technical, so you may lose something in between, but I'm going to be around to answer anything if, if, if there is pressing parts that I've not addressed. Um, so, quickly on traditional banking, well, what we've got, we've got an extreme lack of transparency, right? We just don't have anywhere near the account transparency we can offer with blockchain, we don't know where the funds were, what correspondent bank they were, where they're moving to, how they're moving. It's all one opaque kind of sphere. And, and you know, smart contracts have complete transparency, right? Um, the traditional banking model is highly prone to hacking. The only difference is you don't hear about it, right? So JP Morgan spends anywhere in the region of a half a billion dollars just on preventing a number of hacking attacks, and that's what's disclosed, right? So they're, you know, they're constantly getting attacked, it's constantly lost, but it's just not in the news, right? So you know, the, the problem in hacking is far bigger in traditional banking than it is in crypto exchanges. Um, this idea of business day, right? I mean, 
you know, it's so outdated. So, you know, you send here and they'll tell you there's a cutoff point. You know, you haven't sent it before four o'clock or five o'clock, so it's going to roll over to the next business day. You know, it just doesn't work for the modern economy, right? You, you've got M2M architectures, you're topping up a machine here, it's paying an autonomous car, it's going on, you want a journey, you, you know. You know, when I do, you know, as a company, we do all of our transactions stack on the blockchain. You know, we're not looking at anything longer than 10 minutes, right? So this next business day. And traditional banking has a massive high operational cost, right? And that cost, although you don't see it and it's not so transparent and you think what you put in is what you get out, it's all hidden in spreads, in basis point swap, in exchange swaps, in how much interest you receive, how much you do, how the balance sheet is calculated. Right? So there is a high hidden operational cost that the traditional model, um, which, which, which these are opportunities, right? So, so finding these problems in traditional banking is where the opportunity stack lies in, in, for us in smart contracts. And this problem of trust, right? So what have we got? We've got a problem, a significant problem with trust in, in, in traditional banking. Um, some of it unwarranted, but a large percent of it is highly warranted. Um, you know, if you speak to millennials, you know, I did a tertiary research, you know, they're fearful, they feel unsafe when they sort of transact with a normal, um, when you get a, you know, a 20 euro or 15 euro back or a fine for a missed payment or what have you, you know, you feel cheated, right? But you don't have, so you, all of this is, is angst that sits there, right? And that sits there that hasn't had a chance to be expressed. And that's why we see massive adoption in the likes of Revolut, N26, and all of these new challenger banks, what we sort of call 1.5s, on their way towards um, the crypto banking revolution, right? Um, so what is this new revolution, right? Um, so I, I won't go too much into what is Turing complete and you know what, what it is, but essentially you can put bits of code on a decentralized system that will execute according to how it's been requested to execute and it's completely transparent and for everyone there to peer review without having this third party trust requirement, right? And this, this autonomous programmability of, of smart contracts is why you hear a lot of notion of programmable money, right? Um, and, you know, this immutable, it's often sort of thrown as a passing sort of okay or, or it's there and it's great to have. But it's an actual necessity, right? So if you want to run fair audit trails, you want transparency, you want to go back and say, I did a transaction three years ago at this time to this person, it, um, I need to prove it. It's an immutable record. It will sit there, it, it has not changed, it is what it was, and it's there for you to bring out. So for auditing and transparency and, and, and a lot of this AML, and this is going to be an amazing toolkit, right? So this immutable stack that offers on smart contracts is far and beyond what any centralized bank currently can offer, right? Um, this decentralization, right? Why is it important, or a distributed stack? It doesn't stop. You don't have this scenario where it stops, right? It sits there and it's like, okay, well, it was on that server, it's not there, we can't access our service. You've got constant access to it, right? And, and this transparency, every operation is trackable, right? So when you combine that in a smart contract, you suddenly got, just on your version one smart contracts and what we can offer, you've got something that's probably five to 10 years ahead of anything traditional banking can offer. Okay, um, you know, what do we want as millennials, right? We just don't want, we just want to kick back and don't want the worries, right? So once we've got a trust in a smart contract, let it do its job, right? It's peer reviewed, it's transparent, it's there. So let, let the smart contract do its job. We can kick back, do some gig economy jobs, 
ride around in our Ubers, do whatever we need to. We don't need to worry about when is that payment happening, who did it, what did it, you know, the smart contracts executed it. Um, so we, we was what we one of the interesting points is we can you'll see the banks go to the edge. So the banks will then be just another functionary that can talk to the smart contract. So the bank manager can go and send requests, do what have you, right? Just quickly on a cryptographically secured. You know, this is proven in tried maps, right? So SHA-256 has probably had about a decade, two decades plus of research by senior researchers across the globe that this is not something that you can just come out and, and, and tamper with, right? So it has this cryptographic security that currently any centralized system struggles to offer, right? Um, and this manipulation, right? So, you know, this central authority, there's no real central authority in this scenario, right? It, it doesn't exist, so there is no middleman where the bank can play around and, and, and manipulate this scenario. Right, um, I mean, the key takeaways here, right, is open source. When we say open source, what do we mean by open source? When that contract's deployed on the blockchain, it's there for everybody to see, right? So that allows, so something in academia is quite prevalent is peer review, right? So if something's peer review, it has a, a much more sustainable, long-term acceptance that this isn't some fly off the wall, right? It's got, so, so with a smart contract, and prevalent smart contract, you've got tens of thousands of people looking at it and reviewing it. So you've got a really large wisdom of the crowd peer reviewing, looking at it, and really bringing some fault tolerance to it, right? Clear transaction history, right? If you call up a smart contract, if you call up Peter Scan or something, call a smart contract, you can see every transaction. So when I, we, we've got a number of smart contracts deployed for a number of functions, I don't need to go ask my admin, pull out the records, request it, just throw in the smart contract um, identifier, usually the public key, and it will bring me out every transaction that's coming in and out of that smart contract. So you have an immediate access to the entire transaction history. This balancing privacy, right? You know, it's very topical. We've had uh, Cambridge Analytica and a, a number of other scandals surrounding what, you know, what we call sort of tech 1.0 or 2.0, the Facebooks and the Googles. You know, we can balance, rebalance the privacy curve, right? We can bring it back, we can put levels of zero knowledge, we can put in a, a whole host of factors that are not currently available on any other platform, right? Um, and I think this one deserves a whole talk in its own right, but you know, you're going to start to see a lot more on how the blockchain is bringing back privacy, right? The contract status, right, very boring term, it looks like, okay, something there. But if you've got an operation running, so, you know, we're trying out smart contracts now in Dubai, where you use a smart contract to um, top up your EV vehicle and look at it. You know, if you've got your EV and you're, you're reliant on this smart contract, you want to check its status, right? And that's what the blockchain allows you. It allows everybody who's involved or anyone in that supply chain to constantly monitor that status of that smart contract. Right? That, that's really a sort of opaque topic that's not really discussed, it's not really sold, but this level of trust, being able to check the status on something, it's equivalent to you being able to check whether your mobile has signal, right? You can check whether that status of that smart contract's active. Um, so, you know, we've gone through the, the uncorruptibility of data, I suppose, is what we mean here is that you, you've now filed that data, you know, that data is not suddenly going to be crashed on a server and then, then you've lost your data because we, we, blockchains have this really unique property which is it's a massively replicated database, right? So you now have 20, 30, 40, 50, 500, 50,000 replications of it, right? So, you know, this corruption of data that you have and, and then a lot of 
you know, if you look at credit default swaps, 2008, right, you have a massive crisis. Go back, let's start to dig up the paperwork. A lot of it's not available. It, you know, it was here, it got there, it got shredded. Lehman Brothers, you know, massive shredding operation running up to its collapse, etc. You know, so we, we're not going to face these, what, what are going to look like really legacy problems, right? Where that data was corrupt, that notion is going to disappear. Um, we've gone to a little bit on the wisdom of the crowd, but you know, we've got increasing studies and you're going to see a number of studies over the next sort of 18 months on how the wisdom of the crowd actually in overall builds better markets, builds better efficiency and, and delivers something that we don't. Um, something we've used a lot of, right, is um, these bounties, right, bounty program for security. So you've got security, you don't need to go and hire every hacker on earth or find the best hackers, have all this, expose yourself to this dark underworld just to secure your system. You can put a bounty on a smart contract and say, okay, if you find an exploit, we will pay out for you to let us know about that exploit before it's released on the wild. And, and a project called Olga has successfully implemented this and built a pretty resilient network. So you're going to see a lot more of this bounty okay. stack. Right. So no longer are we going to have this notion of banking days, right? Let's do away with banking days. It's, it, it's, it's autonomous, it's automation, right? It sends a smart contract, it has a processing time, be it one minute, ten minutes, whatever is, is set up to the block cycle. Um, you know, transaction speeds, you hear a lot of talk, this sort of says, okay, how long are we going to take to process this? Perpetuality of the server, and it's, you know, this is where it really gets interesting. These smart contracts are borderless. So, you know, you have all this nation state philosophy that says, okay, within our little walled garden, this is how you're going to operate. This is what's going to occur. This is what you can, cannot achieve. This is what, you know, these smart contracts are completely borderless, right? You put it on there, you put it on the blockchain, they execute it, you know. So, we have people in Mongolia earning from smart contracts they deploy for citizens of Bermuda, right? So, you know, the, the, the idea that there's going to be this nation state that takes sovereignty over what, what's deployed and what contracts is, is going to fast erode. Okay. Um, so the types of services, right? Um, you know, you're applying for a loan. We, you know, you can pretty much apply the smart contract ask, request a loan for it, and, and that just autonomously, whatever it's coded to do, will go and deliver. And we've seen a number of these examples, and if you look at um, kind of DAI and make a DAO model, these are really starting to prove to be pretty successful. You can go out there, you, you, know, you can collateralize loans, you can put token holdings in, so you're gonna see a lot more of the loan stack and the banking stack move across to the blockchain. Wealth management, right? So if you're all familiar with it, you have a lot of this two and 20 model, 2% fees, 20% profits and the wealth management. A set of people sit around and do this amazing kind of wealth management um, portfolio. You know, we've got smart contracts deployment that you can spin up your own stock portfolio and share portfolio within sort of a matter of minutes, right? or one will be essentially a click, a portfolio that exists there that you can go and click on. Right, so you're gonna see a lot of this for the likes of UBS and some of these really big banks and fund managers, and, you know, a big chunk of um, current, the current capital, capitalism stack for wealth management um, have the 2 and 20 model eroded, right? Um, you're gonna, we, we, we move, fast moving to a world where this, this interoperability, what we call sort of um, side chains, atomic chains, into a blockchain, cross chains, you're going to have a banking dashboard, right? You're going to have a dashboard where you can pick and choose what type of smart contracts you want to execute on, right? So this, 
you know, these borders between blockchains are going to fast disappear because you're pulling up your dashboard and whatever suits you, you can go and click on. Payments, right? Massive industry. Um, filled with fees, right? Half percent there, one percent there, two basis point, FX swap. You know, all along the payment stack, somebody's taken a little part of your chain. You know, we're running a payment system and it's completely on the run automated by smart contracts. Okay, we have a bit of fear of ramping that we've got to put the payment stack on, but you know, we don't have any of these half percents and 1.2 percent and you spend on the retailer, he has to absorb some, etc., etc. minimum spend, maximum spend. You're gonna to start to see a lot of this eroded by this smart contract. Um, you know, the, the fast processing really means that all these operations that currently happen from a payment being made, some, some wealth index, whatever, a lot of the costs associated is with legacy systems is the labor costs around it, plus some charges, some what have you, and, and, and what each one of these members do, so why are we saying we're going to redesign the stack, we're going to design out the current banking stack, is we evaporate the need to have a number of functionaries which are just adding drag and slowing down the processing. So this fast processing, if you're an autonomous vehicle that needs to pay a toll charge, go there, pay your lease, you know, so we've got smart contracts that pay out from what they learn, earn from their ride sharing, right? Um, and that pay out for the lease of the car. You, know, you need to have a lot of this in uh, near real time, right? So they, you know, you're gonna see a lot of machine to machine architecture leverage the fast processing. Um, you know, if the, just quickly run through, I don't wanna bore you with the loan stack, but you know, loans form a significant part of society, but, you know, you're posting your collateral on a smart contract, you request a long release date, you put in what type of interest payments you want to do, um, when your collateral can be refunded, which, you know, most people know is a deposit, and, you know, case closed, you've got, you've got a loan contract out there, right? So, you, you know, crypto loans, even in the bear market, have seen a massive uptake, right? And we're really seeing a lot of banks have woken up in the last three months when they've seen the rapid up, uptake in, in, in crypto loans, right? Um, one of the interesting ones we're playing with currently is credit rating contracts. So we're looking at um, sort of Kenya, Nigeria. We've got about sort of eight countries in Africa. And we, we're taking social KYC data, their spending behaviors, habits, and we're starting to create these smart contracts of credit rating, right? So Fitch, Standard & Poor, Experian, you know, all of these, number of these credit rating agencies, they form a function, they form a duty, they tell you how, how, how to assess credit risk. We're starting to sophisticate smart contracts that are replacing entire departments in credit agencies, right? Um, and, and, you know, Individually, it doesn't seem much, but they all form a significant part of the capital stack, right? So, you know, once we can sort of chew away, what we're taking is a, is a, is a piece of, of the cake at each point. Um, banks, banks kind of act as consortiums, right? So, you know, you have correspondent banking relationships, banks share instruments, underwrite instruments together, um, you know, often, you know, go in, do IPOs together, you're gonna to start to see what we call banking smart, consortium smart contracts, right? A consortium of banks come together for smart contracts. The only problem for banks is they're 24 months away from agreeing who's gonna share what in these new banking smart consortium contracts. And you're starting to see the emergence of crypto banks, alternative finance, others who are leveraging the blockchain stack, being able to start to produce these consortiums. So you're going to start to see an alternative to even what's called core banking, this correspondent banking relationship, this stack that is so privileged on who underwrites and who, who, who credits who, who's going to share a correspondent banking relationship. 
And these consortiums, early days, uh, you know, looking at some of the early studies, you're going to see a pretty interesting consortium emerge. Um, I'm on NDA, but there's a, there's a crypto banking consortium that's sort of um, on its way to be launched, and I, I, was, I would say it's going to pretty much challenge what we've got on the status quo. Having your account on chain, right? Um, where's your account currently, right? You've got a load of cards in your pocket, you've got a number of cards in case one fails. Um, you can't really, if the bank app fails or you don't have access or you can't go to an ATM, you can't really have this sort of perpetual always on state, right? So always on state, you can quickly check if you've got decentralized banking, what is the state of your fund, where it is. Um, one identity, multiple banks. You know, when, when we get this new, you know, why this smartphone revolution, why this Samsung with this blockchain wallet in, for every citizen on the planet means that that's your one identity. There's no more like sign up for this, send across your identity. No, just sign. It's got a, it's, it's a built in within a secure element, right? And it just signs and shares your identity with whoever you requested. So this onboarding, this friction for onboarding on services, actually, blockchain's going to have an edge, right? Currently, you know, it, it's it's sitting on the back, but now we're starting to see the emergence of this one identity, right? But one identity with the privacy retained by yourself, right? Um, cost reductions, right? You go to a bank, they have an entire department, right? It's called a KYC department, right? And they all sit, you know, maintain, and they're maintaining all these identities, and all of these costs are adding up and being pushed across to the users and the clients in this one identity, you know, this massive reduction in cost of banking and how, how where the identity and, uh, you know, having this single sort of point of reference for your account. Um, and, you know, the, you, you're kind of outsourcing the security, right? So what you're saying with the blockchain is, I'm not going to employ tens of people, hundreds of people looking at security. Let this happen on chain. Let all the sort of um, secure point breaches that are potential happen on chain, so you kind of arbitrage. So we're, 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 when we describe our crypto banking facilities, we, we arbitrage in the security costs to the, to the chain. Um, I mean, just quickly, I, mean, I, won't, I won't bore you too much, but you know, we're, we're building a bank of smart contracts, or you know, so aptly named smart bank. Um, you can see we take the A out, you know, a lot of, the, we went around, I've been sort of flying, circling, navigating the world, meeting regulators and government, head of state, and you know, the word bank itself is shrouded by a closed group of individuals and that needs to bestow upon you some certification or whatever to call yourself a bank, so, you know, we drop the A in and we're away, right? So, you know, the, the, the friction in, is, is not always so difficult. Um, you know, and we're going to see tens of thousands, potentially millions of tokens that talk to maybe thousands of peer-reviewed smart contracts. So we, we, we're kind of creating a framework that allows what, what would be a smart bank, how would it facilitate. Um, some of the things that we think are going to be used off the bat and we can add immediate value to underbanked, unbanked, to those that are not sort of disgruntled with the traditional banking system is a, is smart share. So we think a single quick access to a smart contract that creates a portfolio for you, right? Um, we got, you know, it, you pick your token contracts, they represent something, you, you request it, it does a transfer request, it mints a smart contract, and bingo, you have your portfolio, right? Okay, um, this is for us in crypto where it really gets interesting and where probably those who aren't native to crypto sort of move away and say, oh yeah, well, you know, you're really getting too technical for us. But we're seeing what we call a stable coin revolution. We're seeing coins that 
are backed by other things that have stability mechanisms built in, which essentially the ability for smart contracts to offer what sovereign states can offer, right? Which is a stable currency, right? And you know, so we feel that if we combine what we've done here with smart swap, is if we combine the DEX with stable coins, we can essentially hedge out risk, right? And we can start to create this stable ecosystem for, for, for crypto, right? Um, it's, it's work in progress. We've, we've been trying it, trialing it with the Maker Die um, stable token, and you know we've been, we've we've hedged out risk to around one percent, right? Uh, give or take it on on a daily basis. Uh, we we think we can push that down to about ten basis points. Um, so very similar to the U.S. dollar or, or the yen, euro. Dexes, right? Um, Dexes are essentially for those that are not it's decentralized exchanges. There's no central party, so we're taking out all these constant, you know, articles you see on the press. So and so exchange got hacked. Crypto X, Crypto Y, blah blah blah. Um, you have an emergence of Dexes. You're going to see a rapid growth in these Dexes, and we've created a smart contract for Dexes that just talks to all the Dexes, right? says, okay, you're a DEX, let's talk it. I want to move some stable coin currency value through you, or I want to take some other tokens and move it into stability. Um, we've seen a great take up on this on our beta run on the contract. It's fantastically easy with a you know, single click. You can head out, go into smart um, on a DEX, take out custodian risk. You'll, you'll hear a lot in traditional backings of custodians and this sort of walled garden of secrets. You know, well, Dexes are starting to fast emerge and take out custodian risk, right? Where everything happens on chain. Um, I'm going to be around, so I'm in the interest of time, I'm not going to sort of go too deep in there. But essentially, we have a Dex smart contract. It talks to a stable coin smart contract, also talks to a non stable coin smart contract, and you can choose. You want, to, you, want, you want volatility or you want to go into stability so you can move your portfolio to either side. Right? Um, you know, we, we then integrate liquidity providers and we can aggregate and pull those liquidity providers. And as a pool, you know, we can do currently around a billion dollars a day. So, you know, we're starting to get sizable, right? In terms of where we're sitting with the crypto markets and where we're sitting with the traditional markets. Right? I think Bitcoin did about, or cryptocurrency did about 1.3 trillion over the pre previous 12 months. So, you know, the values and the numbers here are pretty significant. Um, you know, you're not going to see these complex interfaces. You may see them with the GUIs a little bit more friendly and soft and what have you, but, you know, you want to create a portfolio of shares, put in your token name. Give it a symbol, you want to give it a flashy three letters or whatever. Um, choose which tokens, what shares you want to, want to be part of it, and then create it. And there you go, you've got a, it's something on a smart contract that really is genuine. When you liquidate it, it will give you those shares, whether they're stable tokens or, or security tokens, whatever, and you can go and relinquish the value from them. Smart swap. Um, as I said, you choose which tokens you want to hedge. You put, you put in, in this instance, we sort of, we do a lot with basic attention token. We see a rise in the attention economy. Um, power, we do a lot on the energy grid. So we, we, we've got a number of these. We put these in, we, we, and we say, okay, let's push them all to die. And then it, it just hedges out all the risk and gives us one stable token that we can play with. Okay. Um, I'm around for questions. I don't know whether we're doing a question answer format or we're doing, I'm going to be on a panel later. So we, we can. Uh, it was, does anybody have a question for Israel? Or, or you can just, just, just come and find me. You know. I mean, beautiful Vienna. I mean, we had this big problem with we, we, we're tokenizing the artwork currently. Um, so we, you know, a lot of our job is to let's find out where this latent value is. 
economy and let's, let's, let's bring it on, let's tokenize it, you know, why not? And one of what we're doing is we're tokenizing art and fractionalizing it. We had a problem with it. We said, well, how, do you, how do you put the chain of custody on there? And would Sotheby's and, you know, we had this leading meeting with all these art houses and fine collectors, you know, and a lot of reservation. And then as I was walking down, in, down the street from, from where my hotel is, I saw the, the Museum of Fake Art, right? Which you've got in Vienna. And it, it dawned on me, how about we, we, we fractionize art on the chain without problems? Let it, let, let, let it go and find a floor value, right? So, you know, that's the beauty. We can spin a smart contract up, we can be pretty creative, right? We can go out and test new models and, you know, let, let, maybe let peer review, let the audience do the chain of custody. I mean, you know, there's a high probability it may not work, it may, may have some circumstances, but, you know, I think the latent value of art sitting around and not doing much, you're probably talking about a trillion dollar plus of value, right? So, you know, we, we, we can, we can do a 15 minute smart contract, get some adoption, take out this kind of antiquated model, I think it started in the Renaissance, of, 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 of who, who provides this chain of custody or the proof or the valuation and send that out to the crowd. Um, so, I, you know, besides being here, I'm gonna sort of probably take a visit to the Museum of Fake Art and try to get some valuations, but it's weird how you find inspiration, right? So, you know, each city's got its own unique formula and, and you know, we're gonna start to see, and, I mean, you know, one of the primary reasons why I agreed to come to Vienna, I think you've got a massive recycling industry or, or, or ways and methodologies of looking at recycling, and that's one of our key indexes on how we're gonna bring new value onto the blockchain. So, um, you know, you may find what needs to be tokenized and what a smart contract closer to home than, than you first imagined. So, I really appreciate your time and thank you. Fantastic, it's been a week and so I uh, do This tokenizing, I think we're doing a little feedback, but the tokenizing of the art is, is I, guys, it's gonna be one of the biggest things of 2019. Uh, so it's funny right now. I will uh, actually speak I mean, tomorrow. So, so we're gonna we're gonna vandalize some art, right? So just to throw it out there, um, you know, part of what we do is that. So we 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 missed out on the Banksy that got stripped, um, but we're gonna take some up, potentially another Banksy, and we're gonna literally take out a unit, uh, put it in sort of 24 pieces, and go and let sell each one of those pieces. Some may call it, call it vandalism to the art piece, um, but you know, there's an opportunity for new models, right? Um, you know, if there's a value above zero, then there's a use case for a smart contract out there to go and manage that value, right? So we think, you know, we'll take the risk of that back scene. We, we'll see what value above zero it has once we've fractionalized it in real. But, you know, it, it can happen in a custodian. So we really think Vienna is, or Austria in this region in terms of art, um, recyclables, where, you know, it's, it's, got, it's got an edge, and you've got some valuable sort of home sites here that you can take. Yeah, it's huge. Please, Melvin Lee, give him a hand.